On this week's episode, Christmas edition, classic Christmas movies that we know and love, but who are the real villains? And we have some awesome reviews of the Hunger Games prequel, Godzilla Minus One, and Nick Cage's dream scenario. This is The Hub on Hollywood. I'm James. I'm Jamie. Uh, and let's jingle all the way through this episode. We've got a lot to get to. <laughs> ho, ho, ho. What'd you call me? All Kidding. right, Jamie, this is a, what a year, what a year this has been. Uh, this is going to be our last Hub on Hollywood episode Sadness. of 2023. After this, we are going on holiday break, but Happy. we will be back for the new year. But I would say this is a pretty successful year for the for the podcast, for the Hub on Hollywood. Gosh, we've had so much fun this year. Um, we came back in person. We got ourselves yeah. a nice little studio space with, uh, you know, really cool backdrop and cool seats and decorations, space, space chairs, right. Um, yeah, we saw we saw a bump also in our subscribership on YouTube. If you're not if you are not already subscribed to us on YouTube, please do so. Uh, the Hub on Hollywood. Uh, you can also listen to us on any of the major podcasting streaming services. You can follow us there and leave good, awesome reviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, mm -hmm. iHeartRadio. Uh, but yeah, a lot of really cool, positive changes, and yes. uh, we only have room to grow. Exactly. We watched a I lot think. of movies. We got you know all of our local actors through. One of the, the the longest, biggest Hollywood strikes. Um, it's been a heck yeah. of a year. Um, so we thank those people who have stuck with us on the Hub on Hollywood, who have joined us. And here's to a bigger, uh, more fun, more movie filled year uh, coming up in 2024. And obviously, we hope everyone has uh, just a beautiful, awesome holiday season. And James, so what do you do? In the holidays, what what is like most everyone's tradition this time of the year? What do you need to watch, be watching? I, I would assume a Christmas movie of sorts, a yes. holiday movie of sorts. <laughs> uh, there's actually one that my wife and I are in the middle of. It's called Best Christmas Ever. It stars uh, uh, Jason Biggs, Heather Graham. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, one of those Lifetime, but it's a Netflix movie. We're in the middle of it. So far, you know, it, it is what you would expect mm -hmm. of a, a Netflix Christmas movie. But uh, I, but that is what we do. We get into the Christmas season by watching some of our favorite, most beloved, and new Christmas movies out there, right? That's right. And one of the newer ones um, that was filmed in New England, came out last year, is Spirited. That That's on our yeah. watch list every year now. And it, and it, it, it does too. heavily have to do something with the fact that my son and I are both in it, in the background of uh, a no several of these scenes. No big deal. No big deal. Um, but this is where these movies get made here in New England, and we love to talk about them. But of course, there are the other classics, right? The the, the Home mm -hmm. Alone and the all of the Santa claymation ones and the Grinch and elf. et cetera and Elf and, and all of that. So um, what movies do you watch this time of the year? Let us know down in the comments below. But the thing that we're talking about today, James, is you yes. and I, we've got a bone to pick with some of these classics, okay? I Absolutely. Think some people don't realize who the real villain is in some of these classic Christmas movies. No, I agree. Yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions and I think a lot of propaganda. Oh my if you ask gosh! Me. If, I, if, yeah. I am, if I am to be so blunt, there is a lot of propaganda <laughs> out there, and we're uh, weeding through the uh, through the candy cane and and gumdrop buttons to get to the truth. <laughs> Of the true villains of these Christmas movies, and so when you gave when you uh, this. pitched this idea for for this segment, I loved it. So I started doing some research and going through my brain and try to you know take off the rose colored glasses of like who I'm told is supposed to be the bad guy and the good guy, and did my own research. And um, I think we have a good list. I think I have a good list as well. But um, there was one movie in particular that spurred this idea that spurred this discussion and i will say that um i am in full agreement i okay. this movie is also on my list okay yes so i uh, was just sitting around and i saw an advertisement on tv for the classic rudolph the red-nosed reindeer the 1964 mm -hmm. claymation movie um that that everybody loves right but do we really have have you thought about the plot of this movie recently? Have you really sat down and watched it and absorbed what is happening here? So 
the main villain of this movie, right? Rudolph gets excommunicated. He runs off with another, <laughs> like... Um, Which is hilarious. He, he, he runs off uh, with, with his with little elf, elf friend, with an elf. right? With an elf yeah. who's also an outcast. And they end up on the island of misfit toys. They get chased around by an abominable snowman. And you would think that... Yeah, the villain here that they're running away from, obviously, mm -hmm. is the abominable snowman, right? Yeah. Nay. Nay, I say. Nay. nay. Uh, do, do reindeer say nay? I don't think so. But... I was going to say, it's a, more like a nay deer. A <laughs> nay deer is what I would say. Um, yeah, the abominable snowman, uh, that, that yeti of sword, is just an, an, a wild animal. Does, you know, it's, it's living its own life, but it's painted with propaganda, That's through right. propaganda, That's right. to be the villain of this. But uh, you know who crosses into his territory? Mm. Rudolph, this elf, and this mountain man. Yeah. That's not his fault. No. That's, the, that's his territory. He's doing what But what I think we both do. agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, they do what they do. But, it would, but this is actually on my list as well, because we both agree of who the real villain mm -hmm. of this story mm -hmm. is. Hold your and Santa hats, kids. Other. It is Santa Claus. All right. Santa. Chris Kringle. Yeah, Mother Fri Flippin' Claus and Kris Kringle, St. Nicholas, uh, whatever you, you, you call him. He is a criminal <laughs> in this. He, <laughs> what he has done is a crime. Uh, it is a hate crime. <laughs> Against dear manatee, Against if you will. Against dear manatee. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> awful. It's awful. So if anybody remembers what happens, right, um... Is it Dasher? I think Dasher is his father, is Rudolph's father, and um, or is it Donner? It's one of them. They give birth to Rudolph. Yeah. Rudolph has his shiny black nose, and he tr they try to hide it, right? They shiny or red nose? Red nose. What did I say? I just said bright. His shiny red nose, so they, they hide it with mud and a fake nose and all of this. But when his nose becomes uncovered... Right in his joy and excitement, playing with the other reindeers, his his bright shining nose comes out. Everybody is afraid of him, right? And everybody pushes him away. Right. And who is the chief as bully? As you will remember, no, I was going to say, as you will remember from the from the song as well. All the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. They never let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer games. That's right. But what the song doesn't mention is that Santa Claus is the one behind it as well. Santa is the one who is belittling Rudolph, who's ridiculing him, who's encouraging others to to do the same, right? To to be mean to him, and he blames yep. Donner. He blames his father for his son's like brain mutation. mutation, I guess. Um, and he refuses to let Rudolph be a part of his sleigh for no other reason other than mm -hmm. his bright red nose. Um, I mean, is this speciesist? Is this nosist? Like what what ist is this? It's the worstest. That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. And you know what is even worster? is what? when you know it, it, here comes the big day christmas day santa has to go out there with all his yeah. chosen yeah. chosen ones chosen reindeer but mm -hmm. the fog rolls in the mm -hmm. fog settles mm -hmm. in and oh no what are we gonna do it's, uh, christmas mm -hmm. is canceled but then woo we have an idea we can use this person, this 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 Rudolph that we called a freak. What the other worst names out there? Everything under the book, yeah. uh, in the book, they like, hey, get over here, Mister Bright Nose, uh, you. And then they <laughs> put him in the front of the line and say, Dang. you are going to work tonight. You had no preparation. You have no idea what you're doing. But guess what? Yeah. You're in the front row now. And now Christmas relies. It's all on your yeah. shoulders. So imagine yeah. the pressure that Rudolph is now is now facing. Right. And then all of these people who ridiculed him, who drove him away, forced him on this dangerous adventure where he almost died multiple times. Yeah. And, you know, he finally comes back and they're like, oh, you're our savior. Oh, now we I need you. you. Like, you know what Rudolph should have done? Okay? He should have been like, screw all you people. Yeah. Christmas is canceled. Santa's an a-hole. Yeah. And he should have just gone off and started, like, his own thing. I don't know his what. His own Christmas. Like, his, his own, own competing Christmas. Christmas. I think that exactly. would have uh, that would have definitely, definitely uh, challenged the status quo. Santa's canceled, and now presents are just delivered by the one red-nosed reindeer yeah you know rudolph Hashtag is the new santa 
Santa. Hashtag <laughs> <laughs> cancel Santa. No, that's so funny. That was actually my number one movie and villain on the list as well. So uh, again, great minds think alike. Um, yeah. But yeah, Santa Claus, the real villain, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, Jamie, I'm curious what your uh, number two movie is. Okay, let's see here. I, it was it was close. It was definitely um, neck and neck. Let's mm. see here. Um, but we all love Home Alone, don't we? Yes. We all love Macaulay Culkin's performance as Kevin McAllister and you know the the rambunctious little boy who always yeah. gets left behind and then fights off the robbers with his ingenuity and whatever, right? Yeah. So, are the real villains? The robbers who keep trying to break into Kevin McAllister's house and do him harm? Or are the real villains Kevin McAllister's parents? Yeah. The people with like eight, ten kids who keep leaving their child behind, <laughs> who are mean to him, don't pay him attention. You know, they, they, <laughs> they're always making fun of him and they keep forgetting that he exists. And then they're off on an expensive, magical Christmas vacation uh, while he is left home alone fighting for his freaking life against, against criminals that are breaking into his home. So Yeah. Yeah. I I'd go even further. I would just say the entire McAllister family, they're all the mm. villains of this, of this film. Uh, you have Buzz, who is like the real bully it's of the bully. family. Uh, you have uh, the 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 neighbor kid who also helped you know get this whole thing uh, rolling in the first place. You know, being counted and people thinking that he by was sitting Kevin in the car, right? By sitting in the car. Uh, and then you have again just the whole entire family. This is the this is the season of giving a season of love. Yet they're showing none of it to poor mm -hmm. little Kevin. And what does Kevin do? He has to sleep in an attic while the rest of his family sleeps down in the warm, warm, beautiful, beautiful home. And uh, yeah, so I would say I would put the blame on the entire McAllister family. Yes. And not only that, not only that, not only the parents, the entire family, all of his siblings, but also the police department. OK. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because this would not happen nowadays. Right. This is this is not something that would happen in, in modern times watching this movie. Right. The, the mother calls in a panic to the police station that her son is home alone and they're just completely blasé about they it. They knock They're on like, the door. Well, They're like, I mean, yeah, the kid ain't here. <laughs> he's not here. He's, f I mean, he's somewhere. He's fine. I'm sure he's fine. Like, why yeah. are you worried? Like, what? what? Irresponsible police department. What kind of irresponsible... Uh, right, police department is this. Like, they, they're supposed to serve and protect. And this little boy is not being served. He is not being protected. Um, it's just everybody. There is a systematic failure here. <laughs> um, just overall for poor little Macaulay Culkin slash Kevin McAllister. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, Macaulay Culkin just got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and his TV mom, Catherine O'Hara, uh, mm -hmm. was there in person uh, to uh, to be there for the honor. So that was really nice. You know, nice. being a terrible mother aside, uh, it was nice to see <laughs> uh, the TV two reunited. Mother. Yeah. And then uh, one thing I, I thought was fun was online people spliced photos of the event where like they recreated scenes from the movie. So where like Kevin and his mom are hugging or talking to each other or looking at each other and then they combined that with still shots Aww. from the Walk of Fame events. And so it, yeah. it kind of it had a very fun mirror image. So, um, yeah, That's very happy very for Macaulay sweet. Culkin. Yeah, very, So very what do sweet. you guys think? Who are the real villains? Is it is it the robbers or is it every single other person in this freaking movie? Um, and let us know in the, down in the comments below. Um, and James, what's what's next on your list? So you may have uh, known and seen and read this story. It's uh, well known. Dr. Seuss's okay. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Oh, so, yes, I have. Yes, the I have. book and the movie would have you believe that the Grinch is the mean, inconsiderate, mm -hmm. selfish, no good, rotten character of this story. But right, the real right. villains of this story are the people of Whoville, <gasps> the Grinch. The Grinch is, in fact, the victim of an oh over-consuming, sheltered, shameless, and <laughs> inconsiderate society that turned oh their back on him. 
As Tell we, us uh, how you really feel. <laughs> I will. As we saw in the movie, the uh, Jim uh, Carrey version, we see the Grinch as a small baby, as a child uh, who was brutally ridiculed in school, made fun of by these other who children who forced uh, this this poor Grinch into a life of exile to mm-hmm. live on top of a freezing, lonely mountaintop. All mm-hmm. the while, the sounds of their happiness, glee, festivities, and gluttfulness can be heard mm. at all hours of the day. And the Grinch is tormented by the sound of who horns and who trumpets and who bells and who whistles. And um, in, in the book and in the, and in the movie, he goes on by saying the noise, 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 noise. He snaps. And who could blame mm-hmm. the Grinch to snap, to take his frustration, his pain, and, yeah. and experience? Express it outward by trying to steal Christmas, by taking all the wealth and material things that mm. these who people love and cherish so much. So who Over is the him. victim? It is not the who people. <laughs> it is the Grinch. Right. That's my. Right. That's my. That's I, my you know, and I would add to. Th- I would add to that. I would add to that. Um, I didn't see like the 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 who's as so much as the villain as the commercialization of Christmas. Oh. Okay. And I feel like that is what the Grinch hates so much and probably also the way that the Who's treated him because they are materialistic and, Plus and, just and rude all of that and, and rude. To him. Have you heard the <laughs> lyrics to the, the, the Grinch song, what they call him? Yeah. They call him a heel and an eel, as cuddly as a cactus. They call him a, a seasick crocodile and they say that he yeah, has a black soul and, and a, a, just an empty hole of a person. Yeah. How unkind is that? Again, like, I think any extreme. normal person would snap under all that pressure and ridicule yeah. and hatred. Uh, so, so I think yeah, you're right. I don't blame the Grinch. But In fact, I want him to do it again. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I'm Steal with Christmas. you. Let's go. Let's go help him, right? Grinch part D. <laughs> But not ours, because that costs a lot of money. Yeah. Um, but yes, the commercialization of Christmas. Everything that is vain and shallow and and not in the spirit, right? And that is what he hates. Like you said, the noise, 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 noise. And all of the, the bobbles and things and the lights and the trees and the things and the that. And so it was. it's a shock to me, quite frankly, at the end, yeah. that the Who's remember the spirit of Christmas at all. It was because but of the that... Grinch's sacrifice and his actions that actually <laughs> turned these evil who evilians into some good, who decent Lupians? people. So they owe everything and the meaning of Christmas to the Grinch. Back. Case and, closed. Well, at least they feed him at the end, you know? And the so least they can do. Hopefully they treat him better um, yeah. after that. And and James, as you said, great minds think alike. That that was the one. That was the last one on my Oh, Most excellent. <laughs> as well. So, <laughs> can't believe it. I can't believe well, I have, uh, all these years we've been more. thinking that, yeah. the, that the Grinch was a villain. All right, James. So, what is what round us out here? What's the finale? Okay, what so technically I have two know? more, but maybe, uh, maybe I'll just do uh, this, this last one. But uh, my third movie with the mistaken villain is Elf, starring oh. um, Will Ferrell, of yes. course, and Zoe Deschanel. So, James Kahn's character, Walter Hobbs, who is uh, who is Buddy the Elf's real father, he's made out to be the antagonist of the movie. Someone mm-hmm. who is only devoted to his work, a Scrooge-like character who doesn't want anything to do with his long-lost son or Christmas or joy. But the real villain is introduced right in the beginning of the movie and is Uh-oh. never called out, is never referred to again, is forgotten, and is allowed to just be evil seemingly uh-huh. for the rest of their life and that mm-hmm. person is the nun. the nun the nun in his office who is begging for james con to return the books that were meant for the children that the children really loved the books but uh-huh. as we will remember if you rewatch that scene james con flat out tells the nun that they did not make their payments Meaning they have to take the books back. The nun failed to keep her end of the transaction. And then not only (laughs) that, tries to guilt trip him into just giving them the book. If it Uh wasn't for people like that nun, James Conn character (laughs) might not be so stern, might not be so serious. But instead, 
He is forced to run a tight ship. He is forced to run a really brutal business that, that not only he and his family rely on, but his employees and their families rely oh on. God. And who will suffer the consequences if this whole thing just goes down the hill. So it's like the nun and the people <laughs> like her who try to be greedy and try to uh-huh, try to uh-huh. um, avoid the responsibilities of payments and transactions that are real, that are the real problem in today's society. You heard it here, folks. James hates nuns. You heard it here. You heard it here. <laughs> and I know the Catholic Church has money, so uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, God, that yeah, nun right? could definitely pay. <laughs> that nun could definitely pay. <laughs> All right, and uh, I have fun. one I have one honorable mention that All I right. just wanted to throw in there. It's not specifically a Christmas movie, but it does happen around Christmas time in the film, I guess. And I've watched it at Christmas time. Look, listen. Just hear me out. But one honorable mention, one I just wanted to throw in there, is Sing okay. 2. Have you ever watched okay. Sing, Sing no. 2? Koala, a bunch of animals, they perform, they want to be, you know, actors, singers, whatever. Um, there's a koala named Buster Moon who is... He, he, he should be in jail, okay? Wow. He should absolutely be in jail. Um, this He's bad business practices. Mm. He doesn't pay his taxes. He doesn't pay his actors. He doesn't, you know, he's just... From the very first movie, this guy is just... He, he shouldn't be... Bad news. He shouldn't... He's bad, bad news. news he's bear. bad news. He's a bad businessman. Um, and really, there are zero repercussions for what he does. But in Sing 2... He, him and his all-star cast of, of characters from their local theater uh, go off to the big city where they lie their way into an audition. They lie again in order to uh, get selected. They lie through their teeth to this big-time show guy, Jimmy Crystal, who's called Jimmy Crystal. They lie. They say that they can get... Clay Calloway, this big recluse but famous, famous guy to be a part of this performance. This is fraud. All (laughs) over this is fraud. And of course it doesn't go well because they can't get Clay Calloway. And it's a beautiful show, but they've misrepresented themselves. And really, Jimmy Crystal, the wolf, has every right to have this guy thrown in jail, to have him, you know, to, to get his money back, to sue him into oblivion. But instead, they take Jimmy Crystal... And they make him try to murder the koala. They're like, you didn't, Jesus. you you made me look bad. I'm going to throw you off a building. He tries to oh, kill God. him multiple times. Like, because the only way they could justify what the koala has done is to make the, the wolf even worse, is to make mm-hmm. the, the, the Jimmy Crystal guy even worse. Because if he wasn't a psycho killer, okay, who just murders people who make him look bad, he would have every right to be to take this guy to court, to throw him in jail forever, to sue him for millions of dollars for, for fraud and in, invading his properties, uh, hijacking his hotel, just everything. I mean, I think that the koala is absolutely the villain of Sing 2, and he does not get his proper comeuppance. In fact, they make him out to be the hero. Um, mm. And Bono is in the Sing 2, uh, and I love all of the music in Sing 2, and so do my kids. So that's that's a really good one to watch this okay. time of year as well. <laughs> okay, well, uh, go Sing 2, I guess. Go Bono. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. I, I just, I love these hot takes and um, how angry we, frankly, both are. <laughs> Um, so much injustice. Yeah, uh, let us yeah. know what you found to be unjust if you're listening to us. Remember, you can always find us on our social media platforms at Hub on Hollywood on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, follow us on Threads, Jamie and I, uh, mm-hmm. and myself on Threads. And um, yeah, let us know what your Christmas movie villain twist is. And uh, what do you think about our stuff? But um, we're going to let you know more about what we think, because this is our podcast. And let's talk about some movies that we watched. Jamie, I had a very good week at the movie theater 
Great. The, um, yeah, because watched two great movies, really fun movies, and um, I think a game changer for, for one in particular. And if you don't mind, I'll start my yeah. non-spoiler, pretty, you know, nutshell review of Godzilla Minus One. This is the latest uh, Godzilla film done in Japan. This is not the American version of the current Godzilla franchise that we have over here the one with kong and uh-huh. and all that all those other monsters this is the um a new japanese standalone godzilla film this is great um and this has easily become my favorite godzilla movie that oh, I've, that i've seen nice so basically this takes place post-war japan so they're at their lowest point when a new crisis emerges in the form of a giant monster baptized <laughs> in the horrific power of, of the atomic bomb uh oh visually this is beautiful this was made on a budget of 15 million dollars but you would never ever guess that because the the cgi the visual effects are incredible the godzilla design this is a great godzilla design it really gives you like jaws vibes because there are (laughs) plenty of scenes where it takes place in the ocean and so you see just godzilla swimming towards some of these ships and stuff and it's so so good godzilla's atomic breath is unlike any other atomic Godzilla breath that you've seen in any other film. And it is incredible. It is powerful and uh, something to really see just for that alone in the movie theater. Uh, The biggest thing, however, and the number one reason why this is my new favorite Godzilla movie is that, you know, it's a common thing to say, especially in the recent, you know, Godzilla movies, American versions, uh, and also previous Japanese ones, too. But people would always say, you know, the humans are the side character, like no one's there for the human character development or whatever like all the humans suck they're not written well they're very they're Mm -hmm. written very poorly people just want to see big monsters smash things and fight and you know that has its place that has its time but this movie not only has the great godzilla smashing fighting action scenes that you want but the characters in this film have real depth and you really care about these characters and you really root for these characters and you really don't want to see anything bad happen to them you want to see them survive just because of how well you know fleshed out they are um also this takes place during a very great period for the film you know right after world war ii so the japanese are at their lowest point um they are rebuilding a broken destroyed nation you have japanese citizens who are angry with other japanese citizens because they either left the war or they didn't win the war and so just that aspect alone just that movie alone mm-hmm. what it was very interesting and, and i could watch you know, a movie just by just about that by itself but you have godzilla thrown in there in the mix and it just it's it's incredible one of my favorite movies of the year and i'm not the only one who thinks that because godzilla beats Oppenheimer as the Ooh. highest rated blockbuster of 2023. So, my recommendation: buy a ticket right now and see this in the movie theater. Now that is surprising to me, com- considering the juggernaut that was Barbenheimer when mm-hmm. those two movies came out. Um, so, that, wow, yeah. So, how, how how would you say this compares to some of the other monster movies that have been coming out uh, in previous years? So I like the new God, the, the, the quote unquote original, I mean, I guess the first, because now we have the monster universe now. And so we have the first one, Godzilla, directed and created by uh, Gareth Edwards, my guy, my homie. Um, that one was good. Like it, it was good, like, kind of like um, setting the stage of this version of Godzilla and the world and whatnot. It looked beautiful. You really grasp like the magnitude and size of the monsters, which I think was good. And, you know, uh, um, Kong Skull Island was also good. It was also fun. But I feel like the last three movies have been very, they've gotten very marvelized, if that makes sense, very blockbuster y. And it's kind of gotten away and and it has become even more outlandish than a Godzilla movie already is. It's just, just become more outlandish. And so I've kind of dropped off the American. Uh, this current franchise of of the series, but this one made by made in Japan um, is a breath of fresh air, breath of uh, breath atomic of Godzilla air. air. Yeah. yeah, 
And so I think this is definitely one of my favorite, if I had to compare it with other monster movies, my favorite Godzilla movie, hands yeah. down, and high up there in when it comes to, in general, monster movie. Awesome. Well, I'm very, very happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, now, James, from real monsters duking mm. it out to monstrous humans, mm. okay, are you a fan of The Hunger Games? I love the books, read the books, loved them. And then I I enjoyed part one, and then I think Catching Fire was part two. I didn't catch the last, I think they split the last movie into two movies. So it kind of fell off near the end, but I enjoyed the first and, first and second one enough. All right, because now in theaters that has just come out is a ballad of songbirds and snakes. Mm. The Hunger Games prequel um, yeah. that has just come out. And I think that it was a amazing prequel to a very strong series uh people love the hunger games all the way through and i think that this prequel really does justice um to the hunger games as a series coriolanus snow wait coriolanus coriolanus that's what it, what that is his real name <laughs> okay the burgeoning future dictator with stunning blue eyes and white hair um, in his his glowing youth, <laughs> okay? Mm, okay. Um, played by Tom Blythe. Um, I think that he is just stunning, and he is very believable in this role. Um, I think that he takes even some of the mannerisms that we saw um, from the original series and, and tr um, translates it in his own way as a young snow. So uh, in this story, Snow is vying for the plinth prize that would allow him to go to university. Um, he already has the ambition of being president of this new nation. Uh, we open up and we see him as a young boy in the middle of a war um, when this is all taking place in the United States. So during the dark days uh, when they couldn't eat and they were barely surviving um, and he made it through with his young cousin and they lived with their grandmother uh, and all of their parents were either killed or died. So he's, tr he's vying for this scholarship because his family doesn't have money anymore, they, even though they're pretending to be as upstanding and, and wealthy as the families around them. Um, but a change of plans makes him the mentor to District 12 tribute Lucy Gray, and they together must play the game and play on the heartstrings of those watching in order to make the games entertaining. Um, so Rachel Ziegler plays uh, the tribute Lucy Gray, and who really does sing for this movie. And I thought that yeah, was one of the most amazing parts of this. They filmed her performances live on tape and actually gave her more things to sing as filming went on because she was just so good at it. Um, I think that parts of this story are a little bit corny in that she seems to be the only one with this huge personality or whatever. But once you get past that... Um, so this is the 10th annual Hunger Games, and I thought it was just a really great connection, and I guess you could say fan service, um, in seeing how the Hunger Games uh, came, came to be. Um, and that a lot of the songs also that Lucy Gray writes are the same folk songs that we hear Katniss later singing in the Hunger Games, and we learn why Katniss is so triggered. Uh, or rather why Snow is so triggered by Katniss. Um, like the, the, the hunger tree, the hanging tree song, and who is meeting Lucy Gray at midnight underneath the hanging tree? I wonder who. Mm. Um, Hunter Schaefer of Euphoria flame, uh, fame plays Snow's cousin, who is his moral grounding. She's the voice of his conscience um, and better instincts, but we quickly see how he develops a taste for blood and power, um, and his ambition has clearly been there. Um, but Snow, throughout this story, is towing the line between good and evil and love and hate and ambition and power, uh, and I just think it was just very, very well well done. Someone we all know and love, Peter Dinklage. He plays mm. Casca Highbottom, who is the co-founder of the uh, Hunger Games, who drinks as much as Hamish. 
he is not a fan of what he has created. Um, and he is also not a fan of Snow, who is the son of his former, his former friend. Um, and so Snow is navigating all of these people who are sort of out to get him. Um, and, but there are some things that just don't translate. I think this was pretty close to a, a, a perfect movie, but the end is confusing. I won't go into details. So this is our non-spoiler review part, James. But uh, I will, in a little bit, get to just one spoiler, just one at the end. So, uh, you know, I'll let you know when we're there. Um, the end is a little bit confusing only because there are things that are in the book that don't necessarily translate as well on screen. Because in a book, you can hear what people are thinking. You just read it. You know what their motivations are. Mm. You know what's, what's happening in their heads. And you don't really get that on screen. So I feel like because of that, because this is a book to movie, that it doesn't, the ending doesn't translate as well. But there are tragedies in this movie, James, that have nothing to do with the Hunger Games, have nothing to do with war. And this, that's what I'm going to get into right now. So spoiler alert, spoiler alert, you know, just, just take a walk for 10 seconds and then come back to us. But my husband and I were so upset, James. We were so upset because you get this very attractive Tom Blythe. You get this very attractive Rachel Ziegler. You get their amazing chemistry um, as, as Snow and Lucy Gray. And when they finally are together, when they're finally together in District 12, there is no sex scene. Okay. These two people. <laughs> but there were, there were promises made to the audience, okay? The, the dynamic between these two people, the beauty of these two people. <laughs> and then they finally get together and there's so much tension and then nothing happens. Like, does the movie end? Like, we get one kiss, nothing else after that. Like, they're okay. swimming in a lake and, like, just hanging out by a lake, and that's it. But does There's the movie end, of... like, shortly after? It ends shortly after in a very confusing way. So you want, so you want the movie to end on a sex scene? <laughs> no, I want there to be a sex scene. <laughs> okay. And then we get the, the, the nonsense and the meltdown and everything that happens at the end that leads Snow to become who Snow is. But... There's no like There's implied no like they don't like close a door. There's nothing then... implied. Like it it is it is a would, huge letdown. Would an implied sex scene been enough? It would have satisfied you? me. It would have been enough. <laughs> it would have okay. been enough. I, I'm sorry. It... <laughs> I did just... not see that coming. I did no, not see look. that coming as a big like <laughs> disappointment for the ending. It's a huge <laughs> disappointment. These people wow. are so hot. Look. It's just, when I was in screenwriting, right? I took a couple uh -huh. of screenwriting classes. I'm not trying to be gross or anything, guys. It's just that you make promises to your audience throughout a story. This appeared to be a promise that we were going to get. Oh, and, God. <laughs> and we didn't get it. Were and they I talking that, about it? Like, did they talk about it? Like, when, when no. this is over, we're going to get... We're going to get Look, sex It's all on. in the eyes. It's all in yeah. the eyes. It was implied, okay? Okay. It was... And, and and we just don't get it. And I'm not all for gratuitous sex scenes. I'm not. Yeah. I think that a lot of movies today are actually moving away from that. And that's and that's totally fine. But I think that this, a sex scene here, would have added to the madness that happens later. To, to the total rated? the total mental breakdown of Coriolana Snow. Um, and the betrayal and the meltdown and the, you know, the breaking that happens of his mind at the end of this movie. It would have only added fuel to the fire is what I'm saying. Maybe, maybe the lack of sex drove him crazy. Perhaps. Nah, so it may make sense. Maybe, but that's really frustrating <laughs> for the viewer. I'm just saying, look. Okay. I would have, it would have been close to perfectness. Not just me. I'm not just being gross. My husband agrees. Maybe he's being gross. I don't know. <laughs> but I think it would have added to the movie more than it would have taken away from the movie. But it's what? PG-13? Or yeah. R, uh, I guess. PG-13. You know? So you could, you, even, could have an, you could have implied, like, door closes and you know, little been bow, chicka, bow, wow, kind of. Implied you know. would have been enough. It's like, oh, look, we're all alone in a, in a. Wow in a cabin in the woods and nothing happens are you kidding me i mean again so like do, do they do they say 
man, that sleep was great. It's a good thing nothing happened. Like, is it for sure? Like, is that a point it's for of sure. the movie? I mean, no, no, no. But it, did they make it a point in the movie to like let the audience know that no sex was had, or was it just like they just moved on to the next scene? I mean, I felt like it was it was rubbed in her faces that nothing happened. Like, there's okay. literally like one kiss, and it was not sufficient in my mind to back up the the intensity of their connection that then was completely destroyed at the end uh in a very confusing way i i don't know maybe we can cut this for time but i <laughs> i i'm just saying uh my husband and i left there angry not just disappointed we were angry mm. we're like we thought we were gonna get like one of the hottest sex scenes of all time with these two characters and it would have been amazing and we got nothing so you hate me or not <laughs> do you agree with me somebody please support me <laughs> somebody please agree with me <laughs> down in the comments below um but yeah i think that there was so much promise for this movie and it was close to perfect and the ending just left so much confusion and and want for for what could have been so do you recommend um, the movie or no does this kill the I movie yes i mean it's a solid <laughs> prequel I, I really love the embodiment of the of the snow character. Um, I like making fun of his name. Who's Coriolanus? Like, okay, but um, anus is in his name because he's an ass. Uh, but it is a very <laughs> believable like descent from someone who wanted to be good and had the potential f for good to someone who becomes President Snow. All right. Well, I'm uh, sorry. were you disappointed <laughs> with, with uh, do, do you agree with Jamie? Was uh, was your fire extinguished at the end of this film? <laughs> Let us know. <laughs> Unacceptable. Now, Unacceptable. James, let's bring it back to um, yeah. some sense of normalcy here. Let's talk about uh, dreams that do come true. How about there that? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I watched the latest film in the Nick Cage filmography, Dream Scenario. Okay. And uh, this is a really, really good one. I knew very little about it going into the movie, except for the word that it was a good Nick Cage movie, that it was uh, one of the better ones. So I was like, okay, I like Nick Cage. Let's uh, let's go in blind and like no expectations. And um, I'll start with the, the synopsis. So Nick Cage, he plays Paul Matthews, a hapless man who finds his life turned upside down when millions of strangers suddenly start seeing him in their dreams. Things, oh, however, turn when his night, uh, when the nighttime appearances begin to take a nightmarish turn, forcing Paul to navigate his newfound stardom. Uh, this is described as a horror comedy. I would describe it as a comedy tragedy uh, because oh. there are plenty of funny moments, but there are also plenty of like frustrating and anxious or like uh, anxiety-inducing sequences in this film. Uh, mm. Nick Cage, fantastic. Like This is a really, really... He, he, Pulls out all the stops. He's fantastic in this in this in this role. He disappears in this role. I would I would say this was maybe it started out as a supernatural kind of movie, and then mm -hmm. near the end it takes a turn towards sci-fi. I would say in the last kind of like twenty minutes, and that was like the only I wouldn't call it a jarring turn, but a little unexpected turn in this film that I that I thought was going to mainly stick with supernatural. Um, themes or in that realm but it does uh, turn to a little sci-fi near the end however um this is a this is a really really good movie uh i'm not yeah. sure if, if i would say it was one of the best of the year i wouldn't put it in my top five but i am very glad i saw this in the movie theater uh this is another great film for for nick cage and if you um if you know if you like suspense if you like um, you know, um, what did I say? Supernatural sci-fi. Mm -hmm. I think this mm -hmm. is this is up your alley. I'm not going to reveal much because, again, I think it's good to go in knowing as little as possible. But uh, I would recommend seeing this uh, in the movie theater. So buy a ticket. I, I love how succinct you are, <laughs> and I just <laughs> ramble. Um, okay, so James, what would you do if every person on Earth started dreaming about you? So here's the thing. So it depends. So like in the in the movie, he can't. He's 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 not doing anything to control dreams. So he's not like invading people's dreams. People are just dreaming about him. And mm -hmm. um and at first, uh, he appreciates like the 
the new like kind of stardom and like ooh people notice me now and 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 like he's he's really like leaning into like this kind of weird phenomenon that millions of people are are experiencing and he's and he has no say or anything about it it's just happening and then things start you know these dreams start turning into nightmares and then people start treating him negatively as if he did some of these things in their dreams and he's like i didn't do anything like i'm not controlling anything and so it depends in in mm. a world where i'm just appearing in people's dreams i have no say i mm-hmm. guess that's kind of cool but at the same time if um if i don't know there are pros and cons i guess so I, i'll leave it at that i guess okay it, it depends <laughs> on what kind of dream it's happening yeah 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 i, I don't know about you I, I how might- about you I might find an island to hide <laughs> alone. <Yeah. laughs> if I could like, if I could like Freddy Krueger and go into people's dreams, that would be yeah. interesting and weird. Um, so I think I would make you know dreams a fun experience. I wouldn't be like nightmarish okay. about it. Um, yeah. I'd be like, oh, what do you want? Uh, you want to climb a mountain of ice cream? <laughs> Let's do it, <laughs> or something. So um, yeah, th- that'd be fun. Awesome. Well, yeah. I think that um, there are so many things that we can dream for in the coming yeah. year. Yeah. Um, like we mentioned in the beginning, we had an awesome uh, year this year on the Hub on Hollywood, and we hope to continue growing. Uh, if you get any kind of entertainment or <laughs> or information out of this year <laughs> on the Hub on Hollywood, uh, please subscribe, please share, help us to keep growing and, and do awesome and keep talking about what we love in the new year. Um, and before we let you go on our last episode of the year, James, I wanted to ask you uh, what movies you're looking forward to in 2024. So there are three movies. Uh, one which we both are looking forward to is Dune 2 with mm-hmm. uh, Timothy Chalamet and um, <laughs> Timothy Zendaya. Chalamet. Yes. <laughs> uh, but also there's a new uh, Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt. Both of them are fantastic. So having them both in one movie together is great. Uh, but the fall guy, uh, basically Ryan Gosling plays a stunt man and, and he uh, is, you know, he used to date Emily Blunt's character who was a director of this film, but then, you know, twists and turns happen. And then um, the, the stunts become real live action sequences and, and mm-hmm. scenes that um, as people are chasing after Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt's character. So that looks like a lot of fun. The fall guy, not awesome. free guy, the fall guy. Right, right. And but Free Guy uh, 2 uh, will be in production, I believe, next year. And here's hoping that they come back to Boston. Um, And speaking of Boston and New England, uh, two of the movies that were filmed here in the last year that I'm very much looking forward to seeing. um, Beetlejuice 2, which just wrapped up production um, after the strike. And Madam Web, Madam Web that had been shooting here earlier this year. So... Here's looking forward to a year of awesome movies and incredible films filmed here in New England. And of course, more Hub on Hollywood. That's right. That's right. But until next year, I'm James. I'm Jamie. Have fun, guys. Bye. Bye.